I'm Walter Cronkite. This carefully staged spectacle is Nazi propaganda. It has been technique by which one man poisoned the minds of 80 million people and led them to their ruin. This is the story of that man, Adolf Hitler's minister of hate, Joseph Goebbels. What manner of man was he? Historian H.R. Trevor Roper has this to say. Uh, Goebbels was an impresario. Goebbels had no ideas of his own. He didn't even believe some of the fundamental tenets of Nazism. If you look at Goebbels' early years, he's a man uh, with a great ability for advertising, uh, but without a commodity to advertise. And then he, uh, he tries various commodities, and then he finds Hitler. And he advertises Hitler. He puts Hitler across. But there is, uh, if, when Hitler is gone, he is gone. He has absolutely uh, nothing to separate him from Hitler. He is the showman of the peace. This is our story, Minister of Hate. January 1933, the super salesman with the limp, Joseph Goebbels, helps catapult Adolf Hitler and the Nazis into power in Germany. His reward, the Ministry of Propaganda. His objective, the minds and souls of 80 million Germans. A hypnotic speaker, every word, every rehearsed gesture is coldly calculated to hit its mark. Propaganda is an art, best achieved by genius, Goebbels has written. From the first, this genius has been used to project the myth of Hitler, the god. The creative instrument of fate and deity, Goebbels calls him. For both Hitler and Goebbels, words are weapons. The voice, the instrument by which unthinking emotion must be generated in the masses. Of his first encounter with the impassioned voice of Adolf Hitler, Goebbels reports, I didn't know what was happening. It was as though guns were thundering. I was beside myself. Then, for a moment, the man up there looked at me. His blue eyes met my glance like a flame. This was a command. At that moment, I was reborn. Now I knew which road to take. And with him now, on that road, the road to ruin, the mass of German people. The prestige of Adolf Hitler, Goebbels knows, is the measure of his own power. A physical weakling, little more than five feet tall, a victim of polio in his childhood, rejected by the army in World War I. Goebbels now compensates for a life of poverty and failure. Failure as a dramatist, novelist, and journalist. I have learned to despise the human being from the bottom of my soul, he has said. The Nazi movement gives him an instrument for his frustrated talents, an outlet for his fierce hatreds and anti-Semitism. A government such as ours has to take far-reaching measures, he says. I am determined to work on the masses until they fall to us. H.R. Trevor Roper tells how he does it. He had uh, absolute control over the organs of propaganda, the press, the radio, uh, everything. So they were centralized, and what he wanted to say uh, could uh, be put before the German people without contradiction. Uh, what he did was to create the image of the party, the image of the Führer. And the movement itself was terribly, sort of, as in its beginnings, a sort of frost-blowing, parochial, uh, slovenly movement. Uh, but uh, Goebbels uh, imposed on this much greater clarity the image of a hard, monolithic structure with clear outlines. Films must be used to build up the Hitler myth. Movie director Fritz Lang makes an anti-Hitler film, The Last Will of Dr. Mabusa, and finds himself summoned to Goebbels' office. He tells CBS News correspondent Daniel Shore what happened. So finally I came to a little circle room where I had to wait, and finally somebody said, well, the minister wants to talk with you. You are Mr. Lang. I said, yes. So a double door opened. There was a long, long room, and in the right corner, near a window, there was a big desk, and behind the desk was a very, very small man. It was Mr. Goebbels. I don't know exactly what I felt in these moments, 
but I didn't feel very agreeable. I, I didn't know what he wanted from me. So suddenly he got up and his demagogic face, which I knew from the papers and I had seen him before, suddenly became very charming and very smiling. And with all this charm which he put on, he, 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 he put on his, his charm like a faucet, you know. He came to me and offered me a seat in front of the things and said, I'm very, very happy that you are here, Mr. Lang. And now, naturally, I didn't know what to say. So I said, I'm tickled pink. Mr. Minister, what can I do? So he said, rather apologetically. And there I saw the maliciousness between him because behind his friendliness was always this terrible threat of a man who has all the power to destroy you. He said, I'm terribly sorry that I had to confiscate your picture, but uh, you see, there were certain things which we uh, don't like. So I understood it immediately because in this picture, it was a picture about an insane criminal, a master criminal, I had put into the mouth of an insane professor of philosophy all the slogans of the Nazis, how they wanted to destroy the authority of the German people and then create uh, their realm on top of it. And I said, and when everything is destroyed, we want to create the realm of crime on all this disaster. So I knew exactly what he meant and I said, well, I'm terribly sorry, what is wrong with this picture? So he explained to me that we had to change certain endings in this picture. And then finally he said something which disturbed me very, very much. He said, Hitler had seen a lot of my pictures and that he has said, this is the man who will give us the Nazi picture. Well, I can assure you in this moment I felt like a fish that was hooked. Well, how did you react to it? Well, first, naturally, I was shocked, but I was afraid. And naturally, I said, I'm very, very flattered. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that. But in the back of my mind, I had always a feeling, now you have to get out of here. Lying flees to France as censorship, suppression, and intimidation reign. In May 1933, Goebbels, proclaiming the end of Jewish intellectualism, orders the burning of all books considered hostile to the Nazi regime. Among the flames, the works of the poet Heinrich Heine, who had written, wherever they burn books, they will burn human beings also. Now the prophecy comes true. Dachau, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, the concentration camps become the secret crematoria of a stricken people the Jews, joined by any who dare doubt the theory of a German master race. Publicly, Goebbels calls the existence of the camps a stinking lie. But privately, he says, the Jews are our misfortune. We must hasten this process with cold ruthlessness. In full view for all to see, parades, pageantry, propaganda. Hitler has written, the task of propaganda is to attract followers and Goebbels spellbinds the German people with his stagecraft, with Wagnerian-like spectacles calculated to inflame their emotions and confuse their minds. The masses are uninformed stuff. We must appeal to their primitive instincts, says Joseph Goebbels, the master showman in the wings. At the center of the stage, Goebbels star Adolf Hitler, the deity who will make Germany great again, the divine leader who will protect them, Goebbels says, from the annihilation that threatens from every side. The image of Hitler's infallibility, successfully projected by Goebbels, inflated and dispersed by the camera, becomes a reality for the German people. This is where the Nazi power lies.
Goebbels reaps his harvest. Cheers for Austria, death by Anschluss. Cheers for Czechoslovakia, occupied. Minds molded, wills subjected, they are ready for war. War is the inevitable climax to Goebbels' propaganda. And in 1939, his propaganda follows the soldiers to war. More than a million dollars a day are spent on propaganda. For Goebbels, the shooting war is no more important than the propaganda war. Radio, the Deutsche Rundfunk, is his number one weapon. Originally utilized to direct public opinion, as well as to distract the German populace, now Nazi propaganda is also transmitted all over the world in 27 languages. 14 Uhr und eine Minute, der Wehrmachtbericht. Führer Hauptquartier, das Oberkommando der Wehrmacht gibt bekannt. Aus dem Hauptquartier von den Führer macht das Oberkommando der Wehrmacht das folgende bekannt. Today's official German war communique reads as follows. Der Vermunde, die Artische Allemann, hat die Tade Pischwei Allemann angehimmt in der Hand. Die Allemann Ordu war der Bäschkommandantin, das mit dem... When Goebbels speaks to the German people, who are strictly forbidden to listen to foreign broadcasts, radio wardens see that they listen. Das Reich steht. Die Nation ist unerschütterlich. Das ganze Volk geeint und geschlossen wie die. Sieg heil! Sieg heil! Sieg heil! Goebbels recognizes the tremendous propaganda potential in film. He enjoys supervising every aspect of motion picture production. The writing, casting, and editing of films like the anti-British Ohm Kruger, which grossly caricatures British imperialism during the Boer War. The newsreel, the Deutsche Wohenschau, is made strictly for propaganda. A multitude of cameramen record the surrender of France in June 1940. This is Goebbels' big show. At the same spot in the forest of Compiègne, where the Germans suffered the humiliation of surrender in 1918. In the same railway coach, he stages the French surrender. As an extra touch, Goebbels orders the railway car brought to Berlin for all to see. A solid proof of Nazi invincibility. The tools of triumph are displayed. The weapons of victory become toys for the children of the conquerors. For the home front, Goebbels directs a celebration of German might, proclaiming the tide has turned, the war is won. 
But before long, this taste of victory will sour, and his words will turn to dust. It is 1943. Allied bombers are penetrating deeper and deeper into Germany. They soon carry destruction over all of Hitler's Reich. As disaster mounts upon disaster, one strident voice is heard in the land, preaching victory, crying revenge. The actor's voice of Joseph Goebbels. We look to the Fuhrer to gain strength from his strength. The German people will fight. They will fight in every way, and at the end of the struggle, there will be victory. Our enemies may not believe this, but we will prove it to them. The wail of death and destruction is drowned by the voice of vengeance. We go into battle as though in God's service, with our obedient children and faithful wives before our eyes. We cry revenge for our violated earth, for which our enemies will perish. Goebbels, to build up his popularity, constantly visits the devastated areas. The number two man of the Third Reich, Hermann Goering, had promised the people that no enemy bomb would ever fall on Germany. Goebbels, who has always hated Goering, blames him for the people's plight and realizes his life's ambition by becoming second only to Hitler in the eyes of the German people. Total war, Goebbels calls for it and demands every sacrifice. The British say you don't want total war. They say you want surrender. Do you want total war? I ask you, are you determined to fight for victory? Are you determined to follow the Fuhrer through thick and thin? Are you willing to make the greatest personal sacrifice? homeless nation, Goebbels says, as long as there are people left to defend the fatherland, military defeats mean nothing. April 20th, 1944. It is Hitler's birthday, and Goebbels brings the people out in celebration amid the ruins. Goebbels finds glory in disaster, makes a fetish of defeat. Although no longer do huge, frantic crowds line the sidewalks, Goebbels tries to exploit this event in one of his last propaganda newsreels. Germany is not being defeated, his propaganda says. It is merely defending its victory. But despite all the honeyed, mixed-up words, the false heroics, the empty gestures, the calculated lies. The German people now face a hard reality. No propaganda can diminish, falsify, or erase. Looting, 
Anarchy sweeps the crumbling streets. Dire need knows no laws. These are the people Goebbels had called the invincible master race. Ruined by the lies they too readily believed. Ruined by the propaganda they can believe no longer. We will fight to our last breath rather than allow the enemy to occupy German land. Das wird der Feind in den nächsten Wochen und Monaten zu verspüren bekommen. Dass es etwas anderes ist, Paris und Bukarest. Our enemy will learn that it is one thing to take Paris or Bucharest, something else to capture Cologne or Königsberg. In April 1945, as the Russians are approaching Berlin, Goebbels, the city's defender, orders an army of old men and children to fight to the finish. If victory cannot be attained, nothing is to survive. Joseph Goebbels, his wife and six children, hide in Hitler's bomb-proof bunker. But his directives remain. Berlin remains German. Capitulate? No. Barricades up, the Russian siege of Berlin begins. taken wife Eva Braun prepared to commit suicide. The final role of the Minister of Hate, Joseph Goebbels, is told now by H.R. Trevor Roper, author of The Last Days of Hitler, to CBS News correspondent Alexander Kendrick. Before Goebbels ended uh, his life and the lives of his family, did he continue to act as the propagandist for the regime? Well, uh, he did in a way. Uh, he really stage managed the whole thing. Uh, it was he who persuaded Hitler uh, to stay on. His propaganda was confined by this time to Hitler. Uh, uh, and he convinced Hitler that the right thing to do was to stay on and to commit suicide. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we know that in the end of March, uh, Goebbels was already talking about a final Twilight of the Gods scene, uh, which he was managing. There's no doubt that he managed the whole thing. And he considered that this was his last piece of propaganda which would create a kind of heroic myth uh, which would be so much better than a disorderly disintegration of the regime. And after that, uh, Goebbels and Bormann, who remained behind, attempted uh, to make contact with the Russian commander and make a truce. And failing, uh, they adopted, uh, they went their different ways. That is to say, uh, Go Goebbels stayed behind, uh, killed all his children, six children, uh, and then he and his wife uh, committed suicide and the Russians closed in.